Hello, my name is Nathaniel Osgood. It's a great pleasure, privilege, and honor to be with you uh, today in order to share with you some of the uh, exciting work that we're doing with the Saskin Police uh, Policing Analytics Lab um, and in the areas of, of suicide and opioids. This talk is of necessity very brief to fit in with the program, but I'm hoping to touch on a, a number of major points here. <clears throat> First, I'll be providing some context setting and, and particularly trying to motivate the need to, um, to have computational informatics help to more effectively decide when we're dealing with complex systems, complex systems such as obtain in the areas of, of suicide and opioid abuse. I'll be diving into uh, some of the particulars of our work within the, uh, the suicide and opioid abuse area to give you some feel for the sort of texture of work that one can do in conjunction with the uh, secure, performant environment provided by the Policing Analytics Lab. This environment can allow us to link rich sets of data and perform cutting edge analyses on them. I'll then be talking about um, uh, some of the major elements of value of the sort of uh, analytics that we do and really highlighting the importance um, of, of uh, viewing these models not as crystal balls but as learning tools, as tools that help us learn more quickly, more deeply, and more reliably from, from evidence and from emerging understanding from the trenches. So I'd like to begin by, by talking a little bit about um, the motivations for our approach. And, and these lie in the fact that um, for both uh, opioids and, and for suicide, we're dealing with problems that are um, not merely complicated, but in a in very real sense, technically complex, meaning uh, the sum is greater than, the, than simply the sum of the parts. Um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, we're dealing here with systemic problems, problems that um, uh, cannot be reduced simply to, to to one um, set of small factors, not even one sector, but really across, across multiple sectors, um, social services, uh, justice, corrections, and policing, and, um, and health. Um, if we look at issues with opioids, uh, routes of, of, of exposure and addiction and, and the varieties, the social embedding associated with, uh, with opioid use, the fact that both pain management and, and likelihood of engaging in treatment and likelihood of experimenting with opioids are very much um, socially shaped. Um, the role for of, of policing and its various factors um, and uh, the, the role of, of social disruption, disruption of families as a driver but also as an effect of opioid addiction. Um, uh, the, the complex dynamics associated with tolerance that exposes individuals with a long history of, of having used um, uh, very high levels of opioids to lose their tolerance and then be killed by by um, much smaller amounts that would have left them um, uh, with with little impact previously. We're dealing with complex interactions with other narcotics and, and drug policy uh, such as a very interesting interaction of, of cannabis and its various uh, forms um, for pain management to manage withdrawal symptoms and as a gateway drug. And perhaps most notably here, we're dealing with really big uncertainties about how the crisis will play out, particularly in the context of, of provinces like Saskatchewan, which have, have real differences from, from the coast, for example, where the burden has been largely felt. And here, there's, uh, as in the other, uh, as in suicide, there's this overarching issue of how to most effectively address uh, invest resources for action. Where within the system, within prescribing policy, within changes to treatment um, regimens, uh, moving towards a reform-oriented, uh, recovery-oriented um, system of care, the sort of harm reduction techniques we've seen in in, uh, in BC, where where opioids are actually prescribed for a certain amount of time to bring individuals into the care system or the promotion of, 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 of enhanced uh, detox options, um, enhanced ways to manage care. So really there's this, this question, this fork in the road, where do we invest resources to most effectively effect change to get the greatest bang for our buck? Over in the, in the suicide area, um, <clears throat> we also have a, a similar set of quandaries. We have a, a systemic issue, an issue that, uh, that crosses over um, 
once again, health, social services, justice, and increasingly also, or notably also education areas. Um, we have this uh, diverse manifestations of it in different sectors, which leaves us with this, this quandary that siloed management, focusing on any one sector with the knowledge available in that sector and the limited policy instruments and case management available in that sector has limited impact. And once again, we're dealt with this, this challenge of given limited resources, particularly in, in tight budget times such as currently apply in, in Saskatchewan, where do we effectively most invest uh, resources for action? To what degree um, do we invest in, in universal prevention, for example, or, or what uh, some commentators call selected interventions or indicated interventions? Do we invest in aspects of the health care system? These are very real issues that have big impacts on budget. As Winston Churchill said, when we're out of money, it simply puts even more of a, a, a need to, to, to choose more judiciously, to really think um, uh, more hard about, about what we need to do. You know, both these um, elements of the situation, and opioids and suicide, are, are, um, are share these features because they, they, they reflect the fact that they're complex systems. Um, uh, there are systems where the whole is greater than the, the sum of the parts, and where, in which often reacts surprisingly to interventions. And if we have two interventions, the impact of putting both into place, you know, a, a hub-based intervention changes to prescription policy can be very different than each in isolation. They can be synergistic. They can push back against each other. Um, uh, they're often pronounced in, in surprising us and leading to dilution of our policies, our investments. We're dealing here, in short, with a need to deal with the full elephant rather than just in a siloed way uh, to each of its pieces, which is, has been in, in too many areas, including in academia, the um, traditional way of, of dealing with systems, taking it apart, reducing it uh, to its pieces, and somehow believing that we're going to get an understanding of the whole elephant. And it turns out that it hasn't worked for complex systems. Now, in many domains, um, we, uh, such as I work on extensively in health, we deal with these challenges by leveraging a tool of predictive analytics, um, dynamic models. And these are models that simulate systems over time and that help capture in an operational way hypotheses about how the system works. So in fancy terms, hypothesized causal relationships involving how the, the system works out there. And, and these models um, uh, have often fancy interfaces, as we'll see, but fundamentally provide a way to examine the, the consequences throughout a system of an investment in any one piece of the system. So for example, uh, an intervention within the uh, prescribing area in terms of uh, uh, flagging cases um, that have um, have sought out too many doctors or are um, changing the management of chronic patients for important um, subsets of patients, we can examine how that ripples through the broader system into you know, opioid-related uh, 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 overdoses uh, the police are called to intervene, uh, intervene on, to the, uh, to the burden of, of, of opioids uh, within corrections facilities. And these models can thereby help us to understand um, uh, the behavior that's implied by, by this hypothesis and to test whether that hypothesis for how things work out there in the world that's been taken out of our head and, and put into an operational way um, that distills this understanding from multiple experts. What's the implication for behavior over time and for the impact of likely policies? It can help us understand system vulnerabilities interpret trends and leverage points. Often these models have spatial um, components associated with them, with agents moving around. Um, they're often rooted in, in GIS, but at the same time they have a very visual form that allows us to use them together with stakeholders to, um, to elicit knowledge, to, to elicit challenges to our understanding that, that refine our, our understanding further. Um, 
And these models can be designed to support everything from case level management and, and operational service delivery, all the way up to, to strategic management of, of, of systems. Um, they provide a formidable way of, of, of managing complex systems by serving up as a what if tool to identify desirable policies, help us interpret uh, uh, data and, and anticipate emerging challenges, challenges which are, which are arising. It can also help us um, evaluate the benefits of, of restructuring um, our system and understand trends um, associated with it. Key, by bringing together many components of the system, they can help us make sense of, under one roof, in one way, uh, diversity of constantly updating evidence and data about different pieces of the system, prescribing patterns, uh, patterns associated with use of remand and, and and detox, um, patterns associated with corrections, associated with policing interventions, overdoses in the ER, et cetera. And critically, they help enhance our capacity for reaching out to communities and stakeholders, but for as, as a mode of discourse. Now, in today's world, uh, bringing in uh, elements of, of cross-link data sets from different sectors and with big data, these models can be uh, provided in a way that allows them to be automatically regrounded over time in the evidence, meaning that they learn in some sense over time from the evidence. They're kept current with the latest evidence, and they learn from that evidence to behave more um, effectively. Um, and this can be, in fact, used to illuminate areas of the system which are very poorly known by reasoning through about the system structure and the evidence we do have. So I'd like to briefly take a look at, at several applications of this. The first is in the area of, of suicide. In the area of suicide, we're pursuing a number of, of lines of work with, uh, with different subsets of, of partners. These include everything from the Public Health Agency of Canada to Sachs Institute, uh, Western Sydney University, um, as well as to municipal uh, entities um, working with uh, Lalash, um, which has suffered uh, traumatic events associated with uh, mental health issues that, that um, also have a big uh, footprint in, in the area of, of suicide. And our work is, is just getting finalized now, our agreements in place with social services and justice, and with the Saskatoon Police Service for the SBPAL. The lines of work here verge from um, um, identification of causal drivers uh, for patterns that we see um, um, integrative models to help us estimate the burden of, of suicidal ideation and suicide-related um, uh, concrete planning out there, um, understanding uh, what interventions at what time would have the biggest impact, um, and um, in, in studies of particular intervention strategies. We're also aspiring to really get a look at, take a hard look at which individuals at highest risk and, and um, which, which particular components pose the greatest risk for individuals. In this, we're making use of a wide variety of machine learning strategies, including hidden Markov models, uh, Bayesian graphical modeling, and uh, uh, techniques called uh, uh, particle MCMC and, and particle filtering. With many of these techniques being combined with dynamic modeling, we also are engaged in causality analysis using both uh, uh, causal uh, causal methods based on state space analysis with CCM and plant drawn on causal inference methods as well. Um, this work has involved uh, quite a lot with uh, the Sachs Institute overseas, but increasingly strong modeling work also, um, which draws on the Sachs work uh, together with our partners at uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. Sources of evidence here include um, that we're uh, either drawing on now or, or plan to draw on, uh, include data um, related to longitudinal um, progression of individuals, including traumatic exposures, uh, interventions, aspect of family context and substance use from Ministry of Social Services, for the general population, um, drawing on data um, to be provided by PHAC and also data from large-scale data sources online, such as from Google and Twitter. Um, 
and uh, and anticipated data being kicked in by the police service that, that we've been um, had a brief look at um, in a chaperoned way, um, but are expecting um, a partnership to uh, to provide in coming months. Um, for certain um, populations, Sentinel populations, we're also making use of uh, smartphone apps based around our Ethica platform that we spun off from the university uh, a number of years ago now. Um, uh, to help us uh, to help individuals manage difficult emotions um, uh, and uh, and recognizing warning signs in individuals change uh, based on changes to uh, uh, to uh, patterns of, of sedentary behavior um, to what degree they're getting out uh, uh, socialization patterns um, we've also been working um, at a, a preliminary level with with apps that that explicitly work to optimize social support for individuals, allowing people to share, who are in the concerned circle for an individual to share concerns, to reach out and to pool information regarding that individual. The analytics benefits within this area um, are expected to reach to, to group homes, to correction staff, um, by helping to lower the risks of suicides, allowing them to, to confer more um, focused efforts on individuals at greatest risk, to social workers providing similar um, inform, informing that complements their existing tools, to law enforcement to evaluate risks of, of murder suicides and, and self-harm responses to arrests that, that are underway. And for our, for our ministerial partners in the Saskatoon Police Service to, to inform allocation of counseling and mental health services, particularly in social services, and, and to learn more quickly and reliably from, from the evidence. Just briefly, because time is drawing short, I'd like to talk about our lines of work on opioids, um, recognizing that this is a, is a broad area. Within the opioids area, we're once again drawing on a set of different uh, techniques. One is integrative models tied together with machine learning to estimate the state and the number of individuals out there with opioid disorders that may not be, be recognized as such, um, uh, individuals may be gaming the system, and to evaluate interventions based on diverse lines of evidence. Um, uh, as in suicide, we're also harvesting and, and curating lines of big data evidence, such as uh, Twitter feeds, and using models to think through interaction of, of, of diverse elements. Um, how diverse elements in different areas of the population um, um, relate to one another. And jointly using these to understand the effects of, of, of particular interventions to reduce the burden of opioid uh, abuse. In some cases we're focusing on particular interventions since, such as uh, highly trained service dogs are, are aspects um, much more uh, at an early level of pain management regimens. A key need in the light of the big uncertainties involving the evolution of the opioid crisis within Saskatchewan is to learn more quickly from the change in situation and evidence arising. So our work here as well makes use of Ethica um, to, help, uh, to help monitor individuals with opioid-related disorders. Um, these are uh, veterans who suffer from PTSD, where we're really looking at the dog's impact on occurrences and, and severity of flashbacks, taking advantage of the dog's ability to intervene and looking how does that affect the quality of sleep, how does it affect the, the, the frequency and the severity of these flashbacks as, as uh, garnered through self-report on the phone via the uh, custom interface. Um, we're looking at the impact on affect and outlook, on social contact and isolation measured by tools such as GPS and detecting contacts using um, what are called Bluetooth beacons, looking at impact on, on physical activity and sedentary behavior and substance use. Within the opioid area, we're also making heavy use of models, both in that case of looking at those interventions, but also more generally looking at, um, at uh, uh, individuals with opioid-related disorders uh, in as much as their um, uh, making use of, of, of uh, drugs um, that are of, of prescription quality or from the street, um, readiness for change, um, and, and uh, 
uh, risk of relapse. Um, in terms of uh, individuals' um, encounters with the healthcare system, uh, which can provide a route of entry for uh, more reliable and more reliably taken um, uh, prescription quality medication, taking them away from the irregular timing that can lead to adverse uh, risk of, 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 of tolerance dynamics that can can uh, lead to an, a precipitated overdose if they take too much of an opioid, um, uh, but also provides uh, opioids at much more um, of much more regular uh, levels of, of prescription in some cases, or can provide a conduit for for um, for treatment uh, resources as well. We also have some representation of, of, of an individual's uh, relationship to the corrections area. In some of our work, we're, we're mapping out broad populations w um, um, that are uh, out there in the population um, to try to understand and estimate the number of individuals at risk out there at different stages. Um, uh, say disorders who are who are confabulating and, and, and hiding that to doctors to recognize um, the likely trends we're likely to see within coming months and critically to probabilistically allow us to ask what if questions um, just as you can with this model um, but here informed by incoming data on an ongoing basis it allows us to probably probabilistically assess not only how many people are, are there out there likely in different uh, situations in a, in, a, in a probabilistic way, a way that avoids uh, betting on any one number, but also allows us to, to assess the impact of interventions in light of those uncertainties. For this work, we are now or we're seeking to draw on many lines of evidence. Some of them are from the same sort of publicly available data sets I spoke about before. Big data in the form of tweet volumes related to opioids or keyword searches. But others being drawn from a variety of sectoral partners. Um, uh, recently we had a uh, informal commitment from our Ministry of Justice on to provide a, a cross-sectoral set of, of evidence for our opioid modeling work. And um, some of those major sources of, of evidence from opioid overdoses, to ED presentations, um, to uh, access to the provincial uh, uh, inpatient pharmacy database, prescriptions of opioids, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the provincial uh, pharmacy database, um, and uh, narcotic lab test results were very hopeful for bringing them to the table to inform particular components of the uh, stocks which represent particular aspects of the current situation or flows between them. While those in the audience may be skeptical about the value of some of these data sources, they really per can provide an important complement to the official data sources we have. That is, when we look at these uh, big data data sources, they can clue us into trends ahead of time, give us several weeks, in some cases potentially months, of lead time about an emerging issue because of the availability of geotagged, um, say, tweets on particular topics and the potential for surveillance of, of online aspects of the dark web and, and, um, and types of information that intelligence uh, can give us. What are the benefits here to policing and justice? Well, more judicious policy selection, far longer lead time to learn to or with them. Uh, to deal with emerging problems and enhance efficiency. Um, can also help us prioritize data collection uh, efforts and give us the ability to learn more quickly what works, what doesn't, um, what's likely to work that, that forms so, so large an emphasis of my next component. Because, um, ladies and gentlemen, while my talk is at some levels about predictive analytics and the value they bring to bear, these models, it's critical to realize that the primary benefit of the, of the model of, of this work is not about the models that are delivered. Uh, it's not about viewing them as a crystal ball, but rather the modeling process, because it's the modeling process that helps us over time find out when our, our theories of the world 
just don't jive with the evidence and help us learn fat more faster and more reliably, more deeply uh, from the evidence, honing our understanding of what's going on out there and, and what the impact of different interventions are likely to be for that. So these models are best viewed as not as crystal balls, but as learning, as thinking processes. Models that help us improve our learning by helping us think more consistently, thoroughly, and reliably through the implications of our assumptions. And, and that help us take whatever empirical evidence we have and use it to greater effect, um, to challenge our understanding more effectively, to spot when it just, our, our understanding of the situation out there just doesn't add up. When we put it all together in one of the simulation models, it just doesn't lead to the sort of behavior that we have. It just doesn't jibe with it. To help us inform our choices and inform, advance our understanding of what interventions are best. And I would note that when we have many lines of evidence, important choices to make, these are particularly key needs. And this ability to learn more quickly is particularly key when we have major uncertainties. So here we're talking about models not as crystal balls, but as learning tools, tools that help us over time refine our understanding of the world, to hone it in light of, of rigorous thinking of if the world were, were this way, what would its implications be obs observing with existing or novel metrics from the world, whether that is indeed the case in refining that thinking. This is something that's hard to do unassisted because we have a very hard time projecting what are the consequences, the logical consequences of a certain theory about the world in terms of behavior over time or over space, over networks. The types of tools that we're talking about here types of dynamic models help us do exactly that. They help us take a theory of the world, couple with some evidence, and ask, does it jibe with other evidence? Does it jibe with our observations? And therefore help us refine this theory of the world more quickly. They help us undertake actions, interventions, put policies in effect, observe them more quickly, spot if, if our understanding of their likely effects is off, and refine them in a more savvy way. More savvy way because we can use the model to replan. So a couple key take home messages here. Dynamic models of this sort we're talking about capture collective hypotheses about processes underlying behavior out there in the world. These models are not crystal balls. They're tools for learning more quickly, more effectively, with greater speed, depth, and reliability to help us make sense of evidence um, more fully. Good models are, like this are built by teams and understood by teams. They can help us make better and more judicious decisions. And they can help us live, uh, leverage this data science revolution going on around us in, in places like the SPPIL, which bring together the evidence in a safe, secure, cross-linked, rich environment. There are many problems out there that can benefit strongly from modeling. An investment in a modeling initiative in the opioids area could yield big returns, as it can in the suicide prevention area. Thank you so much for your attention. It's a pleasure to be with you today.